What is medicine? Well, you're out language, you call it my gas. Medicine can be many different things. For example, my native name is Megasniquit, which means medicine grizzly bear. And that's the name given to me by the great creator and by the spirits through my doctor training and vision quests. So people sometimes ask, well, how come you just say, call yourself Nikwich, you know, grizzly bear? I said, because there's many different kinds of grizzly bears. And a medicine grizzly bear is a doctor bear. So it doesn't, so uh, medicine is a form of doctoring, it's a form of healing. It implies when we say we're making medicine, it could be what kind of medicine? Making good medicine? Making bad medicine? So it's a very hard term to define, you know. <clears throat> In general, when we say we're making medicine, we're, it's a combination of things that involve the use of prayers, power, spirituality, and certain powers. So if you're making medicine with plants and herbs, you know, you're using that kind of power. So fundamentally, it implies a certain kind of power. Medicine implies power. But it should imply, and normally would imply, healing. Use medicine for healing, right? I mean, that's what it should imply. But like I said, there's some people that make bad medicine. Or they call it bad medicine. You know? So, uh, including white doctors. You know, white, white doctors take the Hippocrates Code, and I don't know all of it, but one of the things of the code is that they're not supposed to give anybody any poisons. Is that true or not true? That is true. Well, then why do they give people mercury poisoning? Use certain arsenics, you know, in certain pharmaceutical medicines, other chemicals, radiation, chemotherapy. There's a whole host of poisons that they're giving people today. So from my viewpoint as a traditional native healer, you know, they might think they're giving good medicine, but they're mm -hmm. actually giving bad medicine. So in that context, if you use it in the context of medicine, in the healing context, it implies for the use of healing, okay? But it can be expanded beyond that when we talk about, like my dad Charlie, he's a Fontawaydan, He's a medicine man. He's not a healer per se. He's not an Indian doctor like I am. But he's a, more of a ceremonial leader. So there's a lot of tribes in northwestern California and even up through Oregon and Washington. What they call a medicine man is really a ceremonial leader or a ritual performer. And he says he's making medicine for the brush dance or the deer skin dance or the jump dance or some kind of sacred ceremony or ritual like that or even like a woman you know acorn feast medicine woman she's not a doctor or a healer but she makes the medicine for going out and gathering the acorns so in that context the making medicine implies using prayers okay? the power of prayer prayer formulas. So like I said, it's a pretty hard to define. It's, um, I don't even know if there's a certain generic term that can be used in it. But we like to use it in the context of, instead of the words like magic, you know, when the white people first came onto this turtle island, this continent, and they saw our native people conducting rituals and ceremonies and and sacred dances and even doing healing and doctrine and uh, they ask well what are you doing we're making medicine okay um, the white people couldn't understand it you know that some uh, 
say, medicine man or whatever in those tribes could go out and sing a certain prayer and uh, or lay his pipe, smoke, and say a certain prayer and sing a certain song and make like the thunder come. Or if it's already rare, raining, clear the weather up. You know? Or call in eagles with the eagle bone whistle or things like that. So well, they called it magic. To them it was magic. So they're making magic. That's, Native people are very magical. But th there was no magic involved in it. Oh, I'm sure with some of the Indian doctors, you know, did use ledger domain and sleight of hand tricks and things like that. You know, that part's magic. Uh, creating certain illusionary things. But there's a lot of it that was, wasn't magic at all. It was good, solid medicine. You know, working with spirits and powers and forces and prayers uh, would be considered making medicine. <clears throat> what kind of challenges will future shamans face? What kind of challenges? Shamans? Well, you know how I am about the word shaman. That's a Euro Asiatic term the anthropologists use to define a certain kind of phenomena uh, mainly associated with a person who's uh, what we would call medicine man or what some people call medicine man or medicine woman or an Indian doctor but even there it has its classifications of you know being what being a seer being a healer if so what kind of a healer uh, demonstrated certain clairvoyant powers and abilities being able to work and control the weather um, even shamanism even applied to us implies sorcery you know and yes it, was, it is true that there's even like a lot of quote unquote medicine people medicine men and medicine women in certain tribes in certain places that were um, that had both kinds of medicine they had the good and the bad you know they did practice sorcery but I don't like to use the word shamanism because to me, it implies sorcery. And <clears throat> based on the majority of the research, uh, in different cultures, shamans were more associated with sorcerer and being sorcerers than they were in terms of being healers. So um, you use the word, what will shamans face in the future? I think you need to go talk to the white people. <laughs> okay. And I don't mean to be racist because I'm half white myself. But I'm like what you call hey corn, it means old time Indian. You know? Taught and trained in the old ways. Try to be as traditional as I can. Although I doubt very seriously, even though I say I'm a traditional native healer, I doubt very seriously if there's Anybody is a traditional Indian anymore today, you know, because traditions change, for one thing. But if you're talking about Indian doctors, or medicine men and medicine women, uh, there's a lot of obstacles that we face, just like I talk about in my book, in my book called To the Great Spirit. <clears throat> one of the things that I try to emphasize in there is that it's a very, very, very hard and difficult life to be a native healer, a medicine man, a medicine woman in the context of being a healer, or even to be a ceremonial leader for that matter. But uh, So I, I don't know what context you're really referring to, to want me to refer to, you know, because of the way it's broke down. So, and I hate to deal in generalizations, but let's say one of the things I brought up in my book in regards to native healers, if people in Western society still want to associate us with shamanism, or the path to shamanism, the practices of shamanism, being a sacred profession, but more in the healing realm, then what the biggest problem that we're faced with is 
uh, a lot more problems of sicknesses and diseases compared to what our predecessors, our forefathers, our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents going back. Now, for example, whatever particular sickness or disease was going around at that time in their generation, they would usually be subjected to it sooner or later. Okay, so I'll give you some examples. Let's say going way back, when the white people first came here to this continent. All right. The best anthropological research clearly indicates that the only sickness or disease that they can attribute to, to the Native Americans on this Turtle Island was arthritis. Everything else was brought here. Syphilis, gonorrhea, chicken pox, smallpox, measles, tuberculosis, on the cancer, on and on and on and on and on and on. We were extremely very healthy people who lived close to nature, had excellent diets. And it wasn't, we didn't start developing these diseases until the white people came here and brought them. Now, can you imagine being a medicine man or a medicine woman, if you want to call it that, or a native healer, indigenous healer, back in those days when, for example, when George Washington, the great father of, uh, of, our, of your country or whose country, uh, was passing out blankets saturated with measles to the native people on the East Coast. You know, he was practicing germ warfare. So, okay, the native medicine people, you'll call them that, or Indian doctors or native healers, they didn't know what the hell that was. It was a new disease. And it suddenly come into their family, into their village. You know, it's killing off their wives, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, their children, their aunts, their uncles, other tribal members, you know, killing them left and right to get this sickness and disease. And, it's, and there wasn't all that many healers all in one village either, you know, for that matter. There might be, you know, one, two, three, depends on how big the, the particular tribe or the settlement was. Uh, now suddenly they're faced with something that's really new. Prior to that time, they probably mostly dealt with broken bones and torn ligaments and wounds, you know, injuries, snake bites, spider bites, you know, allergic reactions to who knows what, uh, which forms of witchcraft, you know, sorcery being practiced, using bad power spirits or forces against other human beings. Uh, mainly things in that realm, you know, psychiatric, psychotic, psychological types of problems, bad dreams, or, you know, helping people have good luck in hunting and fishing and traditional gambling games or finding a mate, you know, or, or whatever, you know, or, or sometimes they had multiple jobs, sometimes they might also be in charge of rituals and ceremonies. But all of a sudden now here's a new disease and they're confronted with it they had no prior knowledge, no prior experience. So how are they going to get the knowledge to deal with it? They're going to go back on vision quest. They're going to smoke their sacred pipe and go back into the lodge and, and use the, the same old tools, uh, uh, the same old methods or whatever that they've been using on other people, you know, to help doctor them. Spiritual use of spirits, powers, forces, plants, herbs, water, you know, natural elements, and uh, they try to heal, like say, measles. And it, or they go on a vision quest and talk to the creator spirits and say, hey, look, I got this new disease that's killing everybody off, and I'm liable to get it too, you know? Or if I do get it, and sometimes they did get it. You know, we're, uh, tell me what to do. Uh, give me the knowledge, give me the experience, give me the knowledge to help make my people well. And lots of times they couldn't get it, so they died. So oftentimes, so, you know, I can give as many examples as time goes on, you know, like when my mentors and my trainers, 
going back into their days, you know, when they were young. They were in their, like, 40s, you know, and 50s and stuff like that, or um, when they started probably getting their doctor trained, I'd say, like, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, depends on how old they were when they died. And, you know, what was the big thing back then for a lot of the Native people? It was, it was very similar to what it was when the white people first came here, alcoholism, okay? But a lot of other diseases had still gone down through generation to generation. Chicken pox, smallpox, in addition to the measles. Measles still kept reoccurring. Colds, flus, viruses. But some of the main ones were like alcoholism and tuberculosis, okay? So suddenly now they're confronted with that on isolated reservations or rancherias and different parts of the country, you know. Um, some of the native people had been relocated into the urban cities and, and lost a lot of their ways and knowledge. But let's talk about the ones that's still on the reservation uh, where most of the medicine people still resided. But coincidentally, around that time, Christianity had still continued its practices of genocide and along with the government, which was to try to wipe out any of the native healers or ceremonial leaders or medicine people, to acculturate them, to assimilate them, to control and manipulate our own tribal systems and societies. So you've got a dualism going on there. Now, back in uh, this, this focus specifically like uh, Northwestern California, when the famous anthropologist A.L. Kroeber came in to Northwestern California in the late 1800s up into the early 1900s, there was approximately 20 uh, native female doctors, Indian doctors, amongst the Yurok and the Kuruk and the Hoopa. Now, today, there's only one my ex-wife, Tila Donahue Lake. And, uh, and then, of course, there's me, you know, but I'm not female, I'm male. And the majority of the doctors back in those days were, were, female, were women. And the men took on a medicine role as ceremonial leaders and ritual performers for the war dance, the jump dance, the deerskin dance. You know, things like that. So, uh, back in those days, you know, like my mentors and stuff, that's what they would get. You know, they would get chicken pox. They would get smallpox. You know, when they were children, or their parents got it, you know. And a lot of them died from it. You know, and they got TB. You know, and they tried to use their, and there wasn't that many of them around then. They were dying off like flies because of the sicknesses and the diseases and because of the introduction of alcoholism and because of the severe poverty and because of the changeover in diet. You know, the government also took away our hunting and our fishing rights. So when they did that, you know, they took away our rights under the Creator's Law. We have the right to hunt, to fish, to gather our foods, to conduct our sacred dances and ceremonies and rituals and do our healing. That was recognized in U.S. Code Title 25 way back in, in the 1920s and 30s. But uh, the government just totally blew that over and ignored it. They took everything away from us, you know, including our land, you know, and forced our people, our grandparents, and and many of them went to boarding schools and cut off their hair and whipped them and beat them and, and I hate to use the word, but even molested and sodomized them into submission, you know? To do whatever is necessary to uh, keep them from learning their heritage and, or practicing their heritage and culture. And it was the medicine people who became the first of primary targets. The medicine people have always been the first and primary targets. So if you end up in that situation, you know, and there's not that many of them around, and they're getting these sicknesses and diseases, and they don't have the knowledge and the skills and abilities to overcome them. The only way that they're going to be able to overcome them 
is by getting that sickness or that disease themselves. That's the main way, you know. So you, that's how you get the, you primarily get the knowledge uh, to overcome it. Are you following me? Yes. You know, so that's like with me. Four times in my life I've been pronounced clinically dead, you know. Dead is dead, you know. I don't know how long is out. Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, well, yeah. dead. Pronounced clinically dead. You know, and came back to life. But it was from that, from those experiences, you know, being mangled and torn up and, you know, I had my body peeled off of a telephone pole, you know, fractured and broke my pelvic bones, my lower back and spine, and ruptured my kidneys and my gallbladder, my spleen, and, and damaged all of that, you know, and concussion, and you name it, you know, we were dead. But it was from that and my encounter with the spirits uh, who saved my life and brought me back to life, but while I was dead and over in the spirit world, where I got some of the knowledge and the power that lived that led to me being revived, revived, resurrected, revived, being brought back to life, and being healed. And which from that came came certain powers that I, knew, I now work with now, but it gave me the knowledge to help others who are in a similar situation. Are you still following me? Yes. You know, I'll use myself as an example, not bragging or nothing, but using myself as an example. So just like with my predecessors or forefathers, and, many different tribes, uh, many of them didn't make it, you know, and oftentimes even in my lectures I refer to an a example of a Papaco medicine man down there in Arizona that uh, his people got uh, smallpox and, he, you know, they were dying left and right all around him they were dying and he didn't know what the heck to do. That's a horrible thing, you know, to be a you know, maybe they've only had about probably two or three medicine men in that village down there. And so what happens to this guy? He's watching his wife die, his children die, his parents die, his brothers and sisters die from that smallpox. You know, the government was dealing with it too, you know, in large cities and other places. It began to spread like a brush fire. So they, they're not going to worry about a bunch of damn Indians the way they think, right? You know, what the hell, we ain't gonna worry about a bunch of damn Indians. According to our treaties with the United States government, we were supposed to be guaranteed health services and social, well, and education and social services and all that too. But anyway, going back, you know, they didn't have any health service programs on the reservations back in those days, you know. They might have a visiting doctor once in a while or something. And that was about it. You know, so what's this guy gonna do? You know, so he had to go back to his faith, to his belief, to his form of medicine making, to his knowledge, or cry out to the Creator and the spirits, go up on the mountain or into the cave, you know, go slam it, go seek a vision, talk to the Creator and the spirits to share with them the knowledge of how to deal with it. And he came up with, he came up with it, you know, he got that disease. And because of his spiritual power and knowledge and the use of certain herbs or whatever, he built up an immunity to it. And he then he took and he took some of his blood and began to inoculate some of the other people. Before, long before the Western doctors started doing that. Now they came up with inoculation from cows or something. See? So the biggest problem I think we have today is really twofold. My even my dad Charlie, you know, said in my books, he says, you know, I don't know if he used the word my son or exactly or not or whatever, but anyway, you know, he says I'm an endangered species. There's not that many Indian doctors, or even medicine men or medicine women, if you want to call them that, around uh, anymore. Certainly not a grizzly bear doctor like I am. You know, well, I don't know of any others anywhere else. 
There was a bear medicine man who just passed away not too long ago named Corbin Harney. He was Shoshone. Shoshone Paiute, I believe, from Nevada. But I didn't find out until the later years of his life that he had bear medicine or bear, bear knowledge, you know. I don't know if there's any others out there. There could be. Um, but uh, usually the bear doctors were like the strongest ones in healing and stuff like that in many of the different tribes. Okay, you know, I know the Navajos are probably the largest group or society, the largest tribal group in the United States. And uh, I've been down there a couple times and, and uh, you know, I heard and I seen that they got all kinds of medicine people. You want to call them shamans? Uh, I don't think they'd like to be called shamans, but they got all kinds of uh, uh, medicine people, medicine men and medicine women, but different kinds and different categories for different reasons. They have lots of them. I don't know. Maybe they have 30, 40, 50, 100, you know, but there's thousands of Davos. You know, and you go over to South Dakota, you know, uh, the medicine people that I knew over there, they died and passed away. You know, John Fire, Lame Deer, Martin High Bear, Archie Fire, Lame Deer, you know, and even the ones older than that, the older than them, Godfrey Chips, Senior, and, you know, and well, anyway, in later years, the ones I knew was John Fire, Lame Deer, and, and, uh, and Crow Dog, I guess, is still alive, but I don't know if he's doing doctoring or not. He's mostly in the sun dances, and, peyote ceremonies um, so they even they have a definition of different kinds of medicine men I heard young uh, Godfrey Chips is the, the what they call you weepy man a medicine man or a type of healer um, most you know uh, Wallace Blackout he died he passed away I'm sure there's some younger ones coming up over there but I don't know how good they are or whether they have both good power and bad power in them, like some of some medicine people do, unfortunate, but some of them do. And, you know, a lot of the ones that I do, Matt Barry Anderson and Beeman Logan and um, Rolling Thunder, you know, and even my trainers like Calvin Rube and Iraq Indian Doctor was my main tra trainer, and you know, Benita Mastin. Who's a Hoopa medicine woman and Dewey George, the Iraq holy man. He wasn't a doctor, but he was a holy man, ceremonial leader. And you know, just, hey, they're all gone. They all passed away. Florence Jones, a, a real famous and very powerful wind tune doctor, the only one throughout amongst all the wind tunes. They're done Redding in Northwestern California, very polar. She just died a few years ago, you know. And many, almost in all the other tribes, all up and down through California, you know. Um, up in Oregon and Washington, I, of course, I haven't been out circulating around a lot in Indian country anymore, but I don't know of uh, any medicine people really up there, or what, you, what, we, what I'd call Indian doctors or ceremonial leaders. Not ceremonial leaders, but medicine people, actual doctors. Like me, I'm a doctor, okay. Sure, I do sweat lodges and things like that and help some people on vision quest or power quest, but I'm a doctor. Uh, most of the other ones out there are like are importing the Plains Indians. You know, I, I know I know one medicine person out there amongst the northern Cheyenne out in Montana. Um, I had heard <coughs> <clears throat> oh, I had heard, but I don't know for sure if there's any medicine people even left in Oklahoma uh, amongst the Cherokee or the Cherokee in North Carolina or the Chickasaw or any of the five civilized tribes and on and on and on and on and on. You know, so, okay, th this is the problem. On the one hand, the younger generation doesn't seem to be into it. They're, they're more inclined towards uh, acculturation and assimilation although there are some exceptions to the rule in terms of some of the younger ones wanting to relearn, you know, the rich, the sacred dances and ceremonies and participate in that. They're pretty darn relaxed, lax about 
wanting to learn the language, you know, or about wanting to learn things the real way, the hard way, the difficult way. They're always looking for the easy way out. Um, so on the one hand, the younger generation doesn't seem to be picking these ways up, especially in regards to becoming doctors. Okay? And, uh, you know, the doctors you're born with, you inherited, it's will to you. It goes down several generations. So on the one hand, like I said, we're becoming an endangered species. There's not that many around. And the younger ones don't seem to be interested in it. They're more interested in uh, Nintendo and uh, TV and rap music and, you know, and, or being like everybody else in Western society, okay? Some of them have gone back and, and you know, to a certain amount of Indianness, which is good, and uh, starting to get an Indian identity coming back. Well, I got my, you know, enrollment card, you know, and I did this and I did that, but, you know, not many of them at all are going into the training, having any thoughts, feelings, desires to want to be doctors per se. Am I making sense to you? Yes. You know, a few have expressed interest in being like ceremonial leaders, but not doctors, not healers. It's too hard, too tough, too hard a life. Even the ones, my own children included, who have it. I have the, the gift in them from both sides of the family. You know, they're too busy just living and surviving, even though they have it in them. And I guess that'll be between them and the great creator. And when they're ready, they're ready. Okay, oh, yeah, so that's part of the problem right there, a critical shortage of the potential pool for people to become doctors right now. And the second problem is, is that we've had an overwhelming increase of the sicknesses and the diseases. You know, you read my UFO message and everything that I was, the knowledge I was given by the star people back in 1975, right? That, oh, there would come a time in the future that there would be new diseases coming up, you know? New diseases uh, that, would, that we never heard of before. And old diseases would be coming back you know, like TB and bubonic plague and, you know, even measles and stuff like that, that are going to be three or five times, you know, worse than uh, than the older ones were. These would be coming back. That time is now, you know. My predecessors, my forefathers, didn't have to deal with cancer, leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, okay, HIV, AIDS, uh, hepatitis C, hyperthyroidism, Parkinson's disease, multiple cirrhosis, and on and on and on and on. You know? They never they had the slightest idea. They didn't have that back in their days. They didn't know what the hell it was. Okay, it's popping up all around us now in society today, and a few of us that are around. You know, we're totally overwhelmed. And I'm scared. I'll be honest with you, I'm scared. And why am I scared? Because it's too overwhelming. Okay? We need more medicine people. We need good medicine people. Because the Western doctors, you know, they're supposedly trying to do the best they can about it. And we've got viruses they never even heard of before. But just like I said in my UFO, the UFO message, the outer space people gave me, you know, that these new diseases would be coming from animals, from birds, from fish, from the water, from the soil, from the air. That's all come true. That's all in there, you know. That was back in 1975. These things have been coming in now the last 10 years. You see? And if the only way that that I can learn how to deal with it is to get it myself. I don't want to have AIDS. I don't want to have HIV. I don't want to even get cancer, you know? But by having all kinds of people coming to me like that, prostate, gland cancer, breast cancer, you know, liver cancer, this cancer, Hodgkin's disease, leukemia, you know? And 
not hordes of them, because I don't get out there and advertise myself for one thing, but secondly, I'd just be too overwhelmed, you know? Uh, I'm limited. See, he was in the better. I'm limited in my knowledge, you know? I'm not all-knowing. I don't know everything. I just try to do the best I can. I don't claim to be a miracle worker. But, you know, I have, I have helped a number of people, and a number of people have gotten completely healed and got well. Some others, maybe a 70, 80 percent improvement. And, you know, a few people out there, I, I tried the best I could, but I couldn't get them healed. You know, one reason why I couldn't get them healed is because uh, it's like they didn't really believe in it, but they were so desperate. You know, they were willing to try anything, but they weren't, they weren't willing to give up the Western society's drugs or so-called medicines that was killing them all along, you know? <coughs> mercury poisoning, you know? We got mercury coming up into all of the fish. You know, like, like our California tribes in northwestern California, you know, we're mainly fishing societies going all the way up to Oregon and Washington and even Canada. You know, that's our main subsistence. That food is sacred to us. That salmon is sacred. Now, modern-day naturopathic practitioners and holistic health practitioners are starting to get into the act, which is good. We need more of them, too. And they're beginning to realize that like fish foods, especially salmon, has what they call omega-3 in it. That is very healthy for you in terms of preventing heart disease, all right? And they're beginning to realize that things that our old time medicine people knew, and some of us still today know that, you know, certain wild fruits and, and uh, plants and herbs you know, have special powers in them to heal people of many of the sicknesses that they have today. You know, like blueberry, blueberries, okay, for example. You know, and now they're coming out with all these teas, peppermint tea and green tea and white tea and, you know, and, uh, cr cranberry juice, you know. And a lot of, a lot of the, I, I would start to say that 70 to 75 percent of the medicines used in the world come from our indigenous people and we're not even given any credit for it. What's less, some of a piece of the action, you know, a piece of the money, you know, from them exploiting it. 70 to 75 percent of the medicines used, in, even the miracle drug, okay, what does aspirin come from? Willow bark, okay? Where's well, penicillin, the miracle drug? Penicillin, where does that come from? Mold on the oak tree. You know? Where does ibuprofen come from? And on and on and on and on and on. What are one of the best herbs that you could use for people that have urinary tract infections and bladder infections? Bearberry. Uva ursi, they call it. You know? What are some of the best herbs you can use for, for men? Is like maybe I'm giving away trade secrets. Men that have prostate gland trouble or, or even prostate gland cancer. Now well, goes back to the old Cherokee medicine of, of comfrey, using comfrey roots and sal palmato and and, uh, and they need to have zinc in there. The zinc comes from only eating certain kinds of foods. You know? and the pumpkin seeds. Good old pumpkin seeds. A lot of sicknesses and diseases, believe it or not, that people are having today are caused from certain things. They're caused from a tremendous amount of stress in Western society. Tremendous amount of stress. Really laid heavy on our native people. That stress came in the form of forced acculturation, discrimination, and genocide. That passed down from generation to generation to 
generation that became an accumulated effect, but also an inherited sickness, stressors, okay? Now, Western scientists begin to realize that stress can cause cancer, arthritis, you know, a lot of psychotic problems, mental illnesses, uh, diabetes, it can have all kinds of side effects. Another contributing factor is diet, you know, diet. Diabetes is killing our native people all over. Why? Mainly because of what Western society did to us. When they wouldn't let us hunt anymore, wouldn't let us fish anymore, wouldn't let us go out and gather our natural roots and berries and plants and herbs that have all the essential vitamins and minerals and uh, in them, right? You know, that was wiped out and replaced with white flour and yard and beer and whiskey and soda pop and sugar and pizza and on and on and on and on and on and on and on, okay? You wonder why we got health problems, you know? It's a wonder half of our people are even still alive. So we've inherited a cumulative effect. So yeah, diabetes and obesity go hand in hand. It's rampant with our native people all over. But it's also catching up with a lot of people in Western society today. Okay? It's catching up with a lot of people. So diet is a real problem and a real killer. And... Uh, it has a lot to do with it. Even our Indian health clinics, you know, I get so damn upset and frustrated with them for years and years. I've been begging with them and pleading with them, you know, to even to integrate, to bring in traditional native healers, bring in medicine men and medicine women, you know, in, into the Indian health clinics. They have cultural-based approaches to doctoring and healing. They wouldn't do it, you know. Or even, you know, look into how about alternative forms of healing, naturopathic practitioners, and this and that or whatever. Yeah, I'm good. It's only been recently that a few of the Indian health clinics throughout the United States have finally conceded. You know, like down there in Arizona or New Mexico, for example, where they got substantially high numbers of Native people, where they even started bringing in a few medicine people, you know. And uh, some of them have been effective, and some of them haven't been, you know, in terms of their doctoring and healing. Uh, why, you know? Because the majority of the Indian health clinics, the, most of the Indians are sitting on the board or acculturated, assimilated, Christianized, you know? They don't believe, they don't know about their rich, the rich heritage, the rich side, the heritage and culture as it refers to the medical religious side, you know? All they have is a, uh, it's, it's not unfortunate, I'm not bad mouthing them or putting it down. I fully understand, you know, just because of their lack of education. They weren't taught this in their household when their parents were being forced into acculturation and assimilation and indoctrinated into alcohol and now in later years drugs, you know. They weren't taught it in schools, you know, they just certainly hell weren't taught it in their churches, that the churches would badmouth them and put it down. You know, that medicine people are witch doctors, you know. And uh, it wasn't until 1982 or 85 or something like that that finally got our, uh, recognized the, the right to bring back our religion, practice our religion. Public Law 95-341, American Indian Religious Freedom Act. So, hey, there's a cultural lag there, you know, in all of our Indian health clinics. Um, most of them would sit on the board, the Indian health board, and most of them who are managers of them were primarily white people, you know, white doctors who take the conventional orthodox approach, you know, towards healing, they want to rock the boat, or, you know, people who are uneducated and naive about, you know, that, uh, Okay. So, um, sorry for the interruption there. I was on a, I was on a flow of thinking, almost like channeling. It's actually not me. It's the grandmother, and the grandfather spirit speaking through me. Okay. Now let's go back to this. I'm trying to answer your questions with the paradoxes, the parables, and 
and uh, in a roundabout way. <laughs> but uh, getting back to it, the, the, the Indian Health Clinic is an example. Like I was saying, the majority of people who are sitting in power and decision making seats of authority, uh, like on Indian Health Boards, you know, or, or in charge of Indian Health Clinics, are majority of them were white people, although that seems to be improving, but they're being replaced with uh, directors of Indian Health Clinics uh, being, who are native people, but who were raised acculturated and assimilated and educated in white and Western society. So they have no background whatsoever about the value of, you want to call it, shamanism. I call it medical religious practice and knowledge, cultural-based healing approaches. They have no knowledge whatsoever, but yet they're in charge of these multi-million dollar programs. And the people who are sitting on the board, who supposedly are grassroots people, the majority of them could be full-blooded Indian people, some might be mixed or part, but they're sitting in positions of authority who a majority are uh, Christianized, assimilated, acculturated, or uneducated, you know, even in Western society, who have no knowledge or background of traditional knowledge and practices. Why? Because most of the, their sacred dances and ceremonies and rituals and medicine people were wiped out by Western society and usually at the hands of, of the Christians. Okay? So, uh, I'm not bad-mouthing our native people. I'm not putting them down. I'm just pointing out facts and reality. So they have no point of reference. It's not even in their psyche. It should be in their genetic structure someplace. It should be in their collective unconscious somewhere, and I'm sure it is, but they haven't even been taught how to tap into it. You know, don't see the value of it. They don't even recognize, they're not even knowledgeable about the values of alternative forms of healing, the majority of them aren't, alternative forms of healing, what's less traditional native healing practices, okay, concepts and practices, or the value or the merits of it. So how are they going to bring in medicine people? So you talk about what does medicine mean to them? It means Western medicine, okay? When you ask me about what does medicine mean to me, I'm talking about traditional cultural-based approaches to healing by using medicines. And what are the medicines? The medicines are the natural powers and spirits and forces of nature. That's what a traditional native healer is. I don't like to be called a medicine man or a medicine woman, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, you know, because uh, that's the name that was given to us by outsiders, by the way, anyway, you know. I mean, like I told you, a medicine man or a medicine woman in Northwestern California and maybe some other states is more associated with a ritual performer or a ceremonial leader. Why? Because they're making the medicine and the prayers and burning grizzly bear root, kishwif root, you know, ichnish, wath bay root, you know, and using certain plants and herbs uh, to conduct this and using uh, singers and dancers and ceremonial regalia, which is all part of the medicine, the eagle feathers, the flicker feathers, you know, the sacred white deer skins regular deer skins, certain plants and herbs. These are all medicines that are being used to make by the medicine man or medicine woman to make medicine for the sacred dances. <coughs> and the sacred dances and ceremonies are held to make medicine for the earth, to give thanks to the earth, to give back to the earth. You know, positive prayers and you know, to put things back into balance as a form of thanksgiving and recreation stories. So, well, medicine making today, so, so it's, so in, in retrospect, but bringing it up to modern terms, it, <laughs> it's really hard packing in medicine for the people. And a lot of our own people, you know, they don't respect us. They don't appreciate us. 
or they want to put us over there in the category of, you know, a shake and bake shaman or something like that, you know, or falsely accused of, of, of quote unquote, selling the medicine, you know, whatever that amounts to, you know. Um, and sure, there are some so-called medicine people, quote unquote, alleged medicine people, self-appointed or otherwise, who may indeed may be selling the medicine, you know, and if they're charging uh, uh, a lot of money to take somebody into a sacred sweat lodge ceremony or, you know, charge them a lot of money, charging a fee to, you know, to make a medicine bundle or to put on some kind of sacred dance or ritual or ceremony or whatever, yeah, they are selling the medicine. But according to the law of reciprocity, and you know, with most tribal groups, you know, you, you're supposed to offer something, something of comparable worth, you know, in exchange, even to the doctors, and what we call Indian doctors, those kinds of medicine people. They were well taken care of in the old days, you know. They were highly respected, but sometimes even feared by their own people. If they lean more toward the sorcery, you know, someone found out that they could make more money practicing sorcery under the guise of being a medicine person, you know, acquire more wealth and get more money than they could being a healer, a good healer. So a lot of them lean toward that direction, which is sad and unfortunate. You know, so I like to say uh, native healer, you know. Uh, and what is a native healer? A native healer is somebody who uses the natural power, spirits, and forces of nature to try to make medicine on or doctor uh, a person in a more natural way, rather than using artificiality. <laughs> <laughs>